one. My father said that the reason for living was getting ready to stay dead. And William Faulkner said some things boring as a motherfucker straight out of a text where we all lay dying. And I've seen a garden where an urn of glazed coral holds the crushed bones of a 19-year-old boy I never knew. You said that when you found him, his fingertips were black like the noose bruise around his neck. And the pictures pouring out his pockets had visions of the scratched out faces of all the people who never spent the time to know him. You said that you left his body hanging from the cedar rafters until his family came back from England. And the house stayed cold enough to preserve his body. And the house stayed cold enough to keep ghosts wandering around the floorboard, shoving suicide notes down their throats. And you said his hands. And you said his hands. And the way you moved your hands was me reading an obituary of every heart. I've ever seen pumping through thin skin, progressing a way to give in. And I was just a child, in a stillborn costume, kneeling on the carpet, examining my big wounds, penciling cursive quotes onto the wall about trying to resurrect friendships out of fault lines, but too scared to feel the heat of my own body, and there is a gangland of violence under this skin where a 6.7 earthquake shook the foundation of my childhood and ruptured into pulling up daisies from bedroom carpet, shaking hands with rat poison, pedal pushing the canyon, writing the word hate on the crown molding inside of my closet, and I should have known then. But in retrospect, no bright eyes sing songs can channel a pigeon to keep its wings out of hell, and I'm sorry about the phone call and waking you. I guess it's just like breathing, but not wanting to. Some decisions you don't make. Some choices can't even be fake. Sometimes money is all you need for two feet of rope and a kick in the gut. I don't care if you deny it. We are all so obsessed with death as we lay dying. I saw a man cross the street in North Beach, dressed in mourning, carrying white calla lilies, balancing on raven's feet, trying to persuade the vultures to save face. So he could cast a death mask out of post-mortem reflection and a suicide is not worth more than bus fare in this city. And I swung each of my own corpses out of apartment windows just to watch my body crumble, but I've never seen a body die. But I know when I do, his fingers will look like ostrich feathers curling against a gust from the Santa Anas. And enough holy water and oil will spill down these stone steps where you told me about a memory of a lifeless teenager that had exhausted his connection with the earth, so he tied a noose around the birth of his death and dug enough chalk outlines into his skin deep enough to say that the reason for living is getting ready to stay dead, is getting ready to plant calla lilies and get back in the water. Two, I burn Palo Santo because the shamans call it holy wood. And I call myself brother like they do on mountain tops where orange draped spirits carve high row into tree trunks. Do you want me to make you holy? Would you carry raw ocho gemstones in your pockets if you knew that it meant that you could eat without feeling guilty? And I tried purging on words that sacrifice demons. And I played fiddle to some magnolias tied ribbons around these taste buds. And I wonder how the monks in the Angkor region of Asia felt about food. I wonder if they kept diaries, counting calories, or skipped meals as if the hollowness of their stomachs wasn't to feel closer to a higher power, but to feel as thin as the bones that structure them. And I come from California. And I come from a place where women think that skinny is a compliment. And front lawns are littered with silicone and you can't find your front doorstep without tripping over the fault line of superficial beauty. And I say that my parents raised me right. Yeah. To think outside the boundaries of the pressure peers put on me, but that's not to say that when mainstream media and classmates told me that a size 16 was ugly, I couldn't help but remove myself completely. Let tally mark scratches on my hip bones become distracting so I could focus my time looking for the one thing to gag me and spit up day old Adderall to reverse words like you fucking fatty. And I still refer to food as the biggest demon to ever chase me, but those trials are slowly sinking below me, and I see progress on the daily of women creating goddesses out of their bodies as it should be. And I still call myself brother, like the shaved head spirits peering over mountaintops, just observing the delicate efforts that we put into self-destructing. 
and I still pick at my food with wooden spoons that I carved out of Palo Santo. And I burn it because the smoke brings me clarity and my gut isn't so much sunken as it used to be and it brings me back to that place in California where I'm from. And I can envision a forest made out of real bodies. And I can envision never again speaking the words they hate me because of what they see. Because I've learned that beauty can be manifested by the power of believing that skin deep is so far from the reality of me. So I'll burn Palo Santo. So I'll burn Hollywood for you if you'd like to see me. And I'll tell you some stories about trees and fallen leaves. And we'll eat the letters and consonants off the plates. And yeah, we'll eat. And yeah, we'll drink. And yeah, we'll finally be married. Three. by lamplight the night that we camped out in the backyard. But I was too scared after ghost stories and maple tree leaf rustlings to heave the weight of your diary onto me. And these journals are universal because Chicken Scratch Pen writes all the things that we know about ourselves that we would never speak of. And sometimes I'm too scared to even tell blank parchment what I know about myself because it brings me back. It brings me too close. And I'm writing now. The last time I walked through Golden Gate Park, I took the trail around the pond. And lying on the shore was a fish on its spine. Its stomach was torn apart, its ribs cracked open. Some seagull pecked out each secret from its muscle memory. How vulnerable do we get when we uproot the things that we know about ourselves that we would never speak of, like the way your father looked at you with cold silence spilling off the tip of his tongue the day that you came home looking more like a fag than a dyke. Like the day you told your mother what it was like to be raped with a mirror knife to your throat. Are you crying? Are you writing yet? Are you a little bit more stable to build the foundation of the platform you will one day scream on to tell the story of your graph paper notebook? I am cheering for you. Because we all know the things that we would never speak of, like the first time you bound with face bandages as if your chest was a sports injury, like your first induced miscarriage two days before your 21st birthday, like cigarette burns over your heart, maybe you were once alive on paper. I can't imagine the heaviness of your composition notebook or your math word document because it's full of all the things we'll never speak of. We'll never speak of our bodies to the people who love us but can never accept us, and you know this, and you don't need it, but it's real because this can never truly be held. The things that we can never speak of can never truly be held. Have you taken a picture of your progress? I don't care if you're not a poet or an artist, I just want you to take a photograph of your face and compare high school razor lines with San Francisco laugh lines. When I started writing suicide notes again, I switched to writing poems about other people when you die. They're going to plant a sunflower on your grave and throw in all your old notebooks that you left your words in, but I hope that instead you burn those pages in the middle of the desert. I hope you let those words that you would never speak of turn into smoke rings that fill your body with more of your antidote. Counteract every secret that made you choke down crying, and I hope that you're writing now. When I die, they're going to throw bodies on top of me, and those bodies will all have secrets stitched into their skin tones about all the things that they would never speak of. Because they don't actually have to speak it. Because they already walk, breathe, and live it. Thank you, and thanks. <laughs>